All right, thank you all uh, for being here today. Um, welcome to the uh, faculty panel. So uh, before we begin, I would like to start with um, first a um, respectful environment uh, uh, reminder. Um, so the University of British Columbia envisions a climate in which students, faculty, and staff are provided with the best possible conditions for learning, research, and, and working including a respect, an environment that has dedicated excellence, equity, and mutual respect. The, the University of British Columbia strives to realize this vision by establishing employment and educational practices that respect the dignity of individuals and make it possible for everyone to live, work, and study in a positive and supportive environment, free from harmful behaviors such as bullying and harassment. Uh, then uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, UBC Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So we can just reflect on it. Yep. And uh, we'd also like to respectfully acknowledge the Silix uh, Okanagan Nation and their peoples in whose traditional ancestral unceded territory UBC Okanagan is situated. So um, I'd like to start just by uh, thanking the organizing committee for this panel who have assembled a panel uh, to give voice to a wide range of experiences with Gen AI and especially its impact on teaching. In a moment, I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves but before that, I'd just like to give a few notes on format. We're gonna to be together for about 90 minutes and our plan is to devote the first hour to some prepared questions and let the conversation sort of unfold from those. We won't be expecting an answer from each panelist on each question, though any panelist may answer any question or any follow-up question. In the remaining 30 minutes, we are gonna turn the questions to the audience, which you can submit using the Q&A and I'll ask these questions on your behalf. We're certainly not going to be able to get to all of the questions, um, but we will try and get to as many as we can. Now with that, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, just to give your name, the program department or your program department on campus and your role there, and maybe just a little bit about how you've used Gen AI for teaching and learning in particular. Okay. And so we'll do this uh, in alphabetical order by first name, and um, we'll start with, uh, with Andrew. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Andrew Owen. I'm an associate professor of teaching in the Department of Political Science uh, here at UBC Vancouver. That was easy to remember because it's right on the screen in front of me. Um, I've used uh, AI both incorporated it into class in a class where I have um, coding in an introductory statistics class. And I've also tried to limit the use of it in another class where students are doing take home written assessments. Uh, and I'm working on a with one of the other panelists, Bree, who will introduce herself on a TLEF funded project that's trying to explore the challenges that generative AI places on or creates for the written assessment in uh, many arts uh, courses. Thank you. We'll go next yeah, to Bree. Thank you, Joseph. Um, my name is Brian Or Alvarez, and I'm an associate professor of teaching in the Department of French, Hispanic, and Italian Studies. And I'm also quite involved in curriculum development and um, leadership in the Hispanic Studies section, particularly with respect to language. Um, I've used Gen AI minimally so far, but I, I see it as a, a very important uh, piece of, of language learning as we move forward. And even as Andrew mentioned, working in writing-based disciplines or disciplines where writing is often used to assess. Um, so I've experimented a little bit and I hope to speak to some of those um, experiences during the panel. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jane Jun. Uh, I'm the Southern Medical Program Librarian. Um, so I work with folks across both campuses actually with a dual role in faculty medicine in the library. And an aspect of my work involves supporting and instructing on research methods and occasionally aspects of research data. So I'm learning how um, AI is being integrated in these areas. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, my name is Kari Grain. I am a lecturer in uh, the Faculty of Education in Ed Studies. And I run the Adult Learning and Global Change Master's program, which is a fully online and asynchronous master's program. So AI has um, huge implications for us because so much of the work that our students do 
happens online and in discussion forums. And um, so assessment has been at the front of our minds, but also um, an added complexity to this program is that we have collaborating universities. So it's an international master's program. So we work with a university in Sweden and a university in South Africa, and all of our students are together in one cohort. And I will teach the first and the last uh, course of the program, and then professors from the other universities teach the others. So um, there's different, there's really different um, cultural perceptions of AI as well that we are integrating into our <laughs> um, ideas around what our, our policies are um, in terms of using it. And then I also teach in um, just adult learning and education in our ADHD program. Hello, everyone. My name is Ching Shi Tu. I'm an assistant professor of industrial ecology at uh, Department of Wood Science at UBC, uh, actually UBC Vancouver campus. So, uh, but I, I did visit actually UBC. Oh, it's a nice, beautiful campus as well. So, I uh, my experience with Gen AI in teaching is mostly uh, I use it actually in almost all aspects of my teaching. So, for example, come up with topics for in class discussion you know, topics for assignment. And also uh, in addition to teaching, uh, to teaching, actually I use it quite a lot actually daily for come up, coming up with my research ideas for my projects and, you know, you know, look for existing ideas and check my co uh, programming code and all these things. So um, uh, as you can tell, I'm pretty positive towards <laughs> GNI in teaching and research and um, I'd be more than happy to talk more. Yep. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Vikas Meghwani. I'm an assistant professor of teaching uh, in the Faculty of Science at, in UBC, uh, UBC Okanagan campus. I'm situated in Earth and Environmental and Geographic Sciences. I am mainly attached to the ba new Bachelor of Sustainability program, teaching and developing their core courses. Um, and I joined last year in July. And right around the same time, maybe a couple of months before I started using ChatGPT, uh, and started learning it, and I decided to incorporate that uh, in my courses. So it it because I'm teaching interdisciplinary topics, uh, which requires often requires knowledge synthesis, deciding, uh, communicating topics uh, across disciplines. The Bachelor of Sustainability program itself has four different concentrations. The students are also coming from different backgrounds, so it has helped me design innovative. Uh, learning activities for class, deciding on the order of topics for a specific context. And I've also incorporated that as uh, assignments uh, in both courses that I've taught, one in sustainability, one in environmental science. Um, and that, and so yeah, I've incorporated that as an assignment in which the Gen AI may be playing a role of a stakeholder or is playing a role of an expert. And then I ask students to reflect on that. And that has really given me a lot of uh, perspective on how students are perceiving that. Uh, but yeah, so that has been uh, my experience. And I also have to uh, keep in mind how to make the assignments or conventional assignments, which may require a lot of writing, chat GPT proof. So modifying assi assignments that could be are done slightly differently in which these tools may not be easily used. Uh, so that has been my experience, but yeah, we're learning every month and I'm, I'm still calibrating uh, how much I should worry and how much I should use. Thank you. Thanks so much. And as we can see already, there's a wide range of experiences and a really interesting already a theme emerging that I notice is this concern with, you know, sort of, student-facing um, uses of Gen AI, whether they're using them or whether you're using them with them uh, in assignments and assessments and things like that. But then there's also this sort of use of Gen AI to enhance your own work as an instructor. So maybe in, in, in doing things like designing assignments. Um, and so I hope that we'll be able to follow up a little bit on that. Um, but I'm gonna start uh, with um, a question again, uh, anyone can address this that wants to. Um, so what are some of the ways, uh, that you see Gen AI impacting your discipline or profession? 
And what are some future skills students, you think students are going to need to integrate generative AI in their work? So what's it doing in your area? And then what do you think students are going to need to prepare uh, for the impact in your area? And uh, just jump right in if you, if you want to answer. Oh, I'm happy to uh, give it a first shot. So uh, to me, uh, Gen AI is really uh, helpful for quick prototyping of you know any ideas, right? So for example, um, I I have debate uh, lectures in my in my teaching. So coming up with a reasonably comprehensive and well structured topic rubrics and everything it will take time, right? So 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 for me, it's it's really kind of helpful to just kind of throw in a few prompts to ChatGPT, and it will give me a really structured, you know, the content of the slides, the rubric, and you know, and it also give me a few references for both the you know, the 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 pro and against side. And I think that's that's really helpful. And also protein type uh, prototyping for research is also a, a very helpful, basically. Yeah. Maybe I'll jump in next. Uh, so I'm in the field of adult education and, and higher education. So it's very meta. Um, very much the concerns that we're talking about here today are are present in our field of study. Um, one of the things that I think about um, in terms of how it can be used for students, and I think one of the skills that our students need to have in the future if they're working in adult education and higher education is really being discerning about the ethical uses of Gen AI and um, having tools for, for how to do that. And it's interesting because some folks have this perception, um, some colleagues will say, well, I, I just tell them they're not al allowed to use it. But the, I think the, the big issue here is that um, we, we really can't tell. And, and you, you, can have, you can suspect and you can see a word salad, for example, or there are certain sentence structures that it, it, it feels like it's Gen AI. Um, but it, it's really hard to actually accurately police that. So I think my concern is, is thinking through how we can help them use it as a, a, a thought partner tool, but not as something that comes up with their ideas. So how can I use it as almost like a conversation partner if I'm trying to think through this essay that I'm writing, but not have it write it for me? Um, and and I think that's a, a couple of ways that that we are thinking it through in education. I'll jump in um, because uh, some of what Kari said, I think, is exactly what we're sort of thinking in terms of language. Language is very interactive. And um, I think if we're thinking about the future of, of Gen AI and language education in particular, it enhances students' capacity to work independently on their own through adaptive practice. Um, in the FHIS department, some of our beginner language courses have 55 students, and there's just one instructor and one TA. So that's a very large group um, to be able to correct uh, pronunciation, for example, or we can model as much as we want in person, but if they want independent practice on their own, Gen AI can now um, help them fine tune pronunciation. Um, we're also a very diverse campus, so students are coming from different language backgrounds um, and cultural backgrounds. So Gen AI can actually help students who are coming from, for example, a tonal language background, moving toward a romance language background, and help create resources that pinpoint specifically some of the questions that might come up for them as they're learning this new type of Latin language. And then I think if we think uh, in terms of how our students might be using the tools as they move into their own professional pathways, learning to collaborate with these uh, machine-based learning uh, techniques or um, gener generative processes in general will be key, as well as heightening their interpersonal and social and empathy skills and making sure that we are very um, conscious of human oversight and human interaction as a piece of this puzzle. Um, <clears throat> I have two thoughts. One is if I were to describe what I try to accomplish in a class, it would be, you know, some increase improved knowledge of some set of concepts, uh, critical thinking and effective written communication. And we assign writing because I think that it's part, part 
writing uh, the sort of stuff that we assign requires critical thinking skills and careful reading and so on. It's less and less clear to me what students will need 10 years out in terms of the effective communication. Uh, I'm not sure if it's possible to unpack the thinking that goes in to developing an argument and a, a, essentially a paper and how that differs from the writing of the paper. But you could imagine if someone had a set of ideas organized and then they could get AI to write it in the future that maybe I need to be placing less of an emphasis on the effectiveness of their writing. Uh, the second thought is just reflecting on the student panel yesterday. Uh, it was interesting to hear some of them, you know, they, I take all the course material, I upload it, I make a sort of personalized tutor. And that, you know, in terms of our responsibility to, to teach, um, to prepare students to use Gen AI going forward, there's also the ethical issues around intellectual property and uh, a lot of the ways that might be really cool to use it have really clear intellectual property problems. And so that's one of the unresolved questions that I find really uh, thorny in terms of preparing students to be able to use it while not having inappropriate use. So I know we're going long on this question. I just want to add one quick thing. So um, yesterday at the student panel, uh, the students are mentioning how they're generally quite intuitive when it comes to assessing reliable information, aside from like some of those concerns they had um, about like, sharing videos and things like that. Um, so I see like the need for this developing new skills or like honing existing ones. Um, we They talked briefly about prompt engineering, kind of like looking into how can we prepare students to ask prompts that are, um, that give them the kind of answers that they need. Um, and a more nuanced understanding of like risk of bias in language learning models, particularly like an increased awareness of automation bias and confirmation bias would be really good things to focus on with students. I will jump in here with uh, two quick thoughts. As I probably mentioned uh, earlier, my context is interdisciplinary education. So I'm constantly thinking about um, uh, so, uh, for example, sustainability, we are often dealing with wicked problems, right? complex problems in which we emphasize systems thinking. So knowledge integration and dissemination becomes more important. And in that, I think Gen AI can play a, a very important role in helping students um, uh, you know, find meaningful ways of synthesizing knowledge from across contexts. Uh, what Andrew mentioned, uh, downplaying of writing that is something i've also kind of leaned towards uh to kind of that uh, uh, in the context of for example sustainability graduates may be situated in policy context and problem solving etc in which their understanding of the problem and trying to integrate context uh more easily will be more crucial so in that context i think uh uh if they are focusing on a problem as a student something like Gen AI can quickly contextualize that problem in different geographical contexts, political contexts, policy contexts. Um, they are situated here in my class. I try to bring in cases, for example, from all over the world, but that could be expanded. The capacity of doing that can be expanded easily with, with uh, Gen AI for one specific topic it can bring in uh, historical examples and, and, you know, from space and time, it can cover a wide range. And if we can increasingly rely on the accuracy of those examples, then I think it becomes really useful. Thank you all so much. Um, such a rich uh, set of ideas and concerns just off the jump here. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm hearing in the responses, both sort of within single responses, but also across the board, is this really interesting um, dynamic between the way that AI may enhance um, students' ability to do particular things, but it does so by sort of taking away the need for them to do particular things, right? Um, and so we hear a little bit about this a couple of times in, in the, the question of um, the role of writing and written assignments, 
for example, right? So it, it removes maybe some of the labor and can enhance that. Uh, but then there's a question like, okay, is this something that we're worried about them losing access to uh, or losing the opportunity to really train uh, to do? Um, and I don't know, I think that encapsulates a lot of the anxiety uh, as well as the excitement around Gen AI. Um, so I guess my question is, given what, what you've heard here and what your own experiences have been with Gen AI, and particularly thinking again about the, the professions and what you're trying to prepare people for in the world, um, I guess, what are your thoughts on that tension and how are you, how are you navigating that in your own practice um, with either the assignments you're, you're, you're um, giving in or the assessments, um, you know, and where do you fall? Is it, you know, yeah, that stuff is, you know, it's like using an abacus. We don't need to do it anymore. We've got something. Or are you worried that we're losing something? Uh, I can probably jump in with a few thoughts. So I'm in, I am in a state of worry. Uh, yesterday's student panel was humbling and actually uh, uh, reassuring for me. And it made me realize that, so I joined as a new instructor, uh, you know, new faculty member, but at the time when there is a worry around chat GPD and because I was also using it, I also realized that, hey, I need to do something with this. And before, before, it becomes difficult for me to manage if students are using it in class. Um, and in that worry, I have whatever material I get, even for courses that are not new, I have to filter that, modify that. That worry is causing me to kind of redesign, modify. And yesterday listening to students also kind of, it, it made me realize that this, that uh, maybe I am overthinking and over worrying Right. Um, then mention, so I still can use conventional assignments, uh, not worry about that, just that this could be easily replaced with uh, or done with chat GPT. Uh, something that students mentioned that that generally we are there to learn, right? And and if we see something that we can do and it is clear to understand and there's a lot of clear instruction on it, whatever assignment it is, uh, we would also kind of resist using chat GPT. And that is something I am now going to keep in mind uh, to not worry so much if, you know, uh, about, um, about trying to modify every assignment that may just be easily done chat GPT. Maybe I will, still do it in a slightly different context, uh, re-emphasizing academic integrity. Uh, I, because I don't have a reference yet, I was not sure how just talking about it will help, but I think that does help. Uh, and it may be different from undergraduate to graduate, uh, upper level, lower level courses. I'm not sure. I'm gen I've generally taught second or third year courses. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm still in the phase of calibrating this worry versus uh, productive use. Um, yeah, oh, yes, Kerry, go first. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's a very, um, yeah, that, that, I guess that's on everybody's mind, right? So, um, I, I, but I, one perspective I would like to take, a, which probably will be more demanding for the instructors is that we, we need to, and also learn how the employer, uh, like uh, the, you know, the employees, uh, the, the, the employers or the, you know, the companies, they're using Gen AI, right? So, cause our students, most of them will have to go to the market, uh, job market, right? So it's like, if traditionally, if you look at, for example, you are teaching a chemistry student, right? So analytical chemistry, they learn to how to optimate, uh, operate different in instruments. And we know that those skills are required for their future job, right? But for Gen AI, we don't know uh, how their future employer is gonna be using Gen AI, right? So we need to learn about that from their side. So then we can come back and say, okay, this particular task will be automated anyway. So we probably just let students do that. And this part, this type of task 
will need you to be able to understand how to use the tool, but it will not be automated by Gen AI. So those things uh, we need to look at is from two different perspectives, which is really hard for, <laughs> for me, right? So, and, and um, another example is that uh, I think we all kind of try to do some prop, um, prop engineering. So that's we we teach our students. And then, but it's also very important to what I call internalize the knowledge, right? So when you go to an interview, you won't say, okay, let me check my prompt list, right? So you need to be able to uh, internal, internalize some of the knowledges then that uh, you can you can actually be a really good master of using genuine tools. I just wanted to chime in here and, and um, reflect on when I, I'm gonna show my age here, but I remember when the first computer lab came into my elementary school and there were some teachers who were really, you know, early adopters and were insistent that we learned how to use them. And there were some teachers who felt this was an abomination to the learning community. And and I, I think back on that because, you know, AI is here and, and we have the option of being educators who are, um, you know, thinking about ways to ethically integrate them into our teaching and to teach our students how to use them in, in meaningful ways, use it in meaningful ways. Um, I think that there is like a, a both and here, like I feel very worried for, um, you know, critical thinking skills and originality and, and having students practice these things. But I also know that a lot of our learners want to learn. And so if we can have these open conversations with them where we say, look, you could just get ChatGPT to write this for you if you want the easy way out. And, and, and there are some learners who are always going to find ways to, to do that. But there, I think the majority of our students actually like want the enriching learning of figuring out how to write a good, you know, how to write well or how to formulate a good argument or you know i'm i'm putting it in the context of education but um having you know trusting our learners to to choose the path for them in some ways might have to be part of what we do um because we just can't police it it's not it's not easy to police the way that plagiarism was um so we have to really think differently about it as as educators Um, Kari's point of having a conversation with your students is, I think, extremely important because as we probably learned from the panel yesterday, we can learn from our students. And I wouldn't have known about, like, for example, uh, how to assign a persona to um, to AI if I didn't talk to my students and how, how they were using um, large language learning models. So um, I also want to point to, I guess, assignment components. Um, I'm so glad I talked to one of my colleagues um, Dr. Dark, he's a, he's a lecturer in psychology. Um, he spoke about um, incorporating like the secondary component to his writing assignments, where st students were like um, diagrammatically summarizing their written work. So like a visual abstract, for example. Um, and he was modeling his uh, syllabus on uh, Dr. Yoon's from the Department of Computer Science at UBC, which I will drop in the chat. <laughs> For folks, um, it's available on the CTLT website in case you weren't able to take a look at it before. Um, so, yeah, I just feel like adapting assignments in ways where they you're making the guidelines with your students, basically, or with um, consultation with your students, I think is a really great strategy. I think, too, um, the academic integrity piece is it was something that was coming up quite a bit before UBC sort of made the shift from focusing on punitive measures like ac academic misconduct and how to discipline students, as opposed to how to integrate integrity into what we do from our disciplinary angles or as researchers and scholars who are putting our voices in, in communication with others. And so, you know, what what was just said about sort of speaking to students and considering the types of assignments we're doing. I think um, we want to remind students that, you know, different types of assignments or assessments, um, particularly if I'm thinking about a language discipline, like uh, what does academic integrity look like when I'm um, in an oral interview situation where I'm using language, uh, verbal language to communicate with someone else versus what does academic integrity or use of Gen I look like in writing? And so 
um, moving slowly along with them to frame each independent assignment and assessment in terms of how we might engage ethically and responsibly with Gen AI. And then also keeping in mind, and this is something I have to remind myself of because we're very much in the experimental phase, but I don't know that any tools have been UBC approved. So I don't know that there are any tools that are actually FIPA compliant. So we can actually tell our students, use these as part of a course. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet beyond the co-pilot that is embedded in Microsoft Office. So kind of just being real with them about like everything is sort of putting your information and feeding it into the algorithm. Um, and so responsible use also takes into account their, you know, their privacy and, and we want to be mindful of that in assignments and evaluations as well. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, for this rich discussion. So one of the things I'm hearing, again, sort of thematically emerging from this discussion is the importance of relationship building and trust with our students, um, uh, as well as with the world that they're going to be interacting with in, in you know, the form of industry, say, uh, and industry uses of, of AI. So there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of even hooking into the the theme of the conference of uh, you know the, the the teacher in the loop or the even a human in the loop, right? Um, so that's a really helpful and grounding uh, set of ideas uh, to to think about, um, and um, and so it brings up I guess one of our next um, our questions around um, and Bree have already started to address this a little bit and I think a couple of you as well. Um, what preparation for our students looks like uh, in the use of uh, of Gen AI. Um, so, you know, a lot of people uh, in this audience here are faculty members and are thinking, okay, well, this is all great, but what do we, what do, we do with this? Um, so I wonder if you could share some strategies that you are using to engage your students, both in the use of and the literacy with Gen AI, keeping in mind some of the considerations that you've already mentioned around um, you know, ethical use and, um, you know, integrating it into um, learning rather than um, only in achieving, I guess. Uh, maybe I can go and I kind of want to loop in something Brian had said and, and uh, previously was mentioned. Um, as far, So I explored, talk to people, I guess, that how can I ask student to use, uh, you know, Gen AI models or chat GPT in an assignment when they have to create an account, there are privacy concerns and all that. So the, what I did was ask them that this is what I'm proposing. If you are comfortable using this tool or I can help you, I can give you my, we can, I can create an account and offer that to you. So asking them if anyone has objection to using it for this assignment, uh, no one responded in both of my courses. Um, so it kind of told me that they were familiar with using it. They were comfortable with using it maybe for whatever purposes. Uh, and then in terms of preparing them for future, uh, their professional future maybe, and where Gen AI could fit in. I have one example where in my course, I was teaching environmental impact assessment, uh, which is a practice, environmental consulting practice. Uh, and many students, uh, at least some of them, uh, wish to choose that as a professional path in the future. So I'm teaching from the practice and in my, I had a chat GPT based assignment in which they were to treat or use the tool as an expert. So feed a project detail into the tool and the tool will, as an expert, will, should recommend what considerations what environmental considerations, impact considerations should the proponent and other agencies involved in the project should keep in mind. So the basically now the expert is offering recommendations. So I asked them to try to first verify that and, and critically evaluate that, that is it surprising? Is it expected? Is it too specific? Is it general? Uh, is it able to cover the specifics of the project and its geography? Uh, this is like a, uh, solar farm project in Vancouver Island. Uh, uh, new project, so not a lot of detail about the project is available on the internet. 
So it's just using whatever expertise the tool is able to uh, gather and then reflect on it. And in the reflections, I, I mean, I'm, I won't share quotations, but I've found variations of from optimism to pessimism. And one of the reflective questions was, how do you feel using it? What utility the tool may have in the practice? Um, so uh, many of them said, no, this can only be used in a rudimentary fashion. A human consultant would be the way to go. But then there were some fears also that we don't, like, I don't know. Uh, this seems, this is, seems very surprising to me. And uh, this could uh, uh, really replace some part of consulting work in the practice. Uh, and I also had students who were using ChatGPT in that, in that way for the first time, right? So this was, uh, but, but my intention of using that, using the tool in that way was for them to start imagining the role a tool like this could play in practice as you're looking ahead in the future. Um, so kind of like uh, touching on the anxiety that was mentioned by a few people here. When students come to me um, anxious about using AI tools, I kind of remind them like that. I, I learned this from Dr. Emily Bender at the University of Washington, so professor of linguistics. She reminded um, folks that AI is a marketing term for automation. So kind of once I get that out there, asking the student like, well, what is being automated with the tool that you're using? And then we kind of looking at the privacy policy with them because privacy policies can be really intimidating and then kind of figuring out what do we look for in the privacy policy? Um, it's mainly like, where is the data being stored? Like for example, on US servers or something like that. Um, and also what are they doing with that data? And once we kind of find where those are, they can look for them in other tools before they use them. And then we can talk about intellectual property as well. Like, are you gonna be using that tool to summarize um, articles? What articles do they index and from where? Um, and like kind of analyzing, like if you're doing it ethically, like the students talked about yesterday, um, summarizing maybe using ChatGPT, but like, unless it's like an open source article, it wouldn't be something that you'd want to be posting onto um, a platform like that. So like, yeah, having those kinds of discussions. I think that's really interesting, Jane. Um, I, I think, you know, we probably all have a responsibility to teach ethical and effective use of generative AI, AI tools, but none of us know much about them. Right. Uh, and it's it's sort of a task that's distributed across all of us. And so, you know, the worst case, not worst case scenario, but at one end of the continuum is every class has a 30 minute lecture on how to use it. And they're just hearing the same thing over and over again. And that's a waste of their time. And the other op uh, opposite end of the spectrum is nobody does it because we assume someone else is doing it. And that's a, a real challenge. But I like I really loved your summary of just like the basic things that you walk through with them. Uh, Cause that would be, I want to invite you to my class to, to teach them that. Sorry to talk again, but I, I want to plug that actually for basically all faculty and instructors. You can talk to your subject librarian. Um, the subject library, like specific library into your area, we all kind of talk, are talking to each other about AI tools um, as they're developing. So having a conversation with your subject librarian could actually kind of help you like figure out what do I want to discuss with my students at this point in time. Uh, and, and also just want to add to it, I, I, I don't know if this kind of training already exists, because if you, uh, I think every student when they get enrolled, they kind of encouraged or some in some cases mandatory to take for example workplace harassment training you know conflict of interest so if from ctlt uh sorry to put your uh, more workload to you if we can come up with like a 30 minute kind of really high level training about what gen ai is how should you use it for each student i think student will be really happy to do that i can i can even give you know extra credits for my students if they take it right so um, that then that kind of solves the problem of like instead of teaching this the same thing individually in different styles. We have like a central training modules we can refer to every single time. 
just want to add to, um, I think that's a great idea. I'm, I'm skeptical of a lot of the strategies that people have proposed for the sort of in my social science area of types of assessment. So scaffolding projects where they do an out, uh, a research question, then an outline, then the final paper. The idea being that it's harder to just, you have to do the steps. So it's, you're making the process more explicit and it's harder in some way to just on the night before ask the computer to write your essay. But you can ask the computer to write each step, right? And it's more than happy to. Uh, or to re reflection pieces or where you personalize it and say how the material relates to your own personal experiences, again, you can get the computer to do that. There's not, I haven't, I find, I have the same anxiety and complete uncertainty about how to approach it other than no assessment of things unless you're doing it in front of me. And that's got horrible um, pedagogical and equity-based limitations. So if anyone's got the silver bullet, let me know. So uh, I don't have a silver bullet. <laughs> But I, I think one thing we, we need to think about is is that it's like, you know, when we entered a Zoom era, right? So before that, we, we don't schedule back-to-back -back meetings. Now we have this tool that people know that oh, you can just click a button and you, you go to a different uh, meeting room. Now, everybody expects you to have more meetings. There can be the same thing for Gen AI, right? So if, again, in the future, if your boss are expecting you to be more productive by using those tools, then we need to get students ready for that right um yeah so that might be the expectation for on the other end so um yeah yeah thank you um oh, Kari, go ahead sorry i just want to say like from a macro perspective this is a really interesting conversation because i've been looking at the questions in the chat as well and somebody asked something which i think is important and it's like are we you know, what about, are, are we trying to say that having a thought partner who it, that is AI is the same as having a thought partner who is another human? And it, it these are just like bringing up questions of like, what types of students and humans are we cultivating through higher education? And, um, you know, there are, there's the pragmatic approach, which is like, we're trying to make sure that they have the skills they need for the workforce. And if the workforce is expecting this, then, then then we need to prepare them for that. But there's also like this very human element of what are the, you know, what are the values we want our, our students to uh, walk through the world with? And not that we're necessarily here to teach value. It depends what, you know, what faculty you're in, what department, what you're teaching. But um, there is this real question of of the humanness of it, of 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 the of the um, I suppose the the spirit that we want to imbue our teaching with, and and that we want our students to have. So yeah, the, and they're all valid, valuable questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, you know. Again, we're sort of coming back to these themes of, you know, first off, this this tension, right, between, um, you know, the enhancing, um, the sort of work enhancing capabilities of Gen AI versus the um, pedagogical gaps that I might leave behind, whether those be in sort of maybe depreciated skills. But also in the, the sort of the, the training of ourselves as, as human beings to live in a society um, that some of this stuff is often um, taken to be connected to. Um, but uh, and, you know, there, there, there seem to be a lot of undischarged and unanswered tensions about what this is all going to look like. Um, I really appreciate, appreciate it because you're... Um, strategy that you mentioned which it sort of just involves students in that conversation right like okay we don't know what the industry is going to look like but let's try this out and see okay what do you think um and it, it ties back into that theme of sort of conversation um and uh trust and collaborating with our students um rather than a sort of adversarial model um that we can sometimes uh, fall into um Yes, I think we've got time for one more question before we turn to the um, to the audience questions. Um, I guess um, 
I'll just ask, does anyone, so we've had, we've had a couple of concrete use cases um, described a little bit, but would anyone else like to share sort of ideas that you've had and things that you've done in your classrooms um, that work that uh, maybe people from the audience can draw inspiration from? Uh, well, I, I was with you until you said that work. Um, so I, this spring, I assigned a research paper. I had the scaffolding. I, I assigned new types of papers that weren't just to go find some literature and synthesize it. Uh, and then I wrote in the syllabus, and just while I say the word syllabus, one thing I definitely heard from students yesterday and just generally is whatever the policies you have around generative AI use, put it in the syllabus, but don't just put it there. Talk about it probably multiple times through the term because they are overwhelmed with five different instructors with very different policies. Uh, and so it's just helpful to them to be as explicit as we can. So I said that 20% uh, of the papers I'll randomly pick and I'll invite you to come and talk to me about your paper. And so the idea was sort of like uh, airline security where they randomly pick you and then they swipe your hand to see if you have something on it. Um, and that was entirely as a disincentive, right? It was a punitive approach and it was a disincentive to not do your own work. Uh, and then I waited till after I submitted final grades because I didn't want to get into it in an actual formal integrity process. And I talked to three students about their papers and it was nice to chat with them about the course, about their papers and what they liked and didn't like. Uh, and then I got to the point where I'm like, okay, how did, if at all, did you use generative AI? And at that point, it just felt deeply uncomfortable. Like I hated the experience and I resisted where I was like, mm, I, I could probe, right? I could take a paragraph and say, tell me exactly what you were thinking here. But it just felt entirely uncomfortable to me. Uh, so I don't know if the threat worked or not. It's very difficult, I find, to even know who's using it and what, especially if they're using it in a savvy and perhaps good way that it's like a back and forth and idea generation. They draft something, the, the AI revises the draft. You know, that that would be... I'm not sure if that violates my policies or not, frankly, but um, that would be okay. But they would under, you know, they'd be able to speak about the paper and the learning still occurred. Uh, so that was an attempt that I don't know if it worked, and it certainly was not enjoyable. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I'll also just share uh, just two brief examples. So I haven't necessarily. I'm going to share my screen actually because I prepared something. Um, so these are just two examples of how I've used it in an online course. So um, I actually just created this prompt. I usually have two options for prompts they can they can respond to, and this was one of them. And I took a reading that we had, and I asked them to basically um, open ChatGPT and enter the following prompt. I gave them this prompt and then I asked them to personalize it. So keep in mind that I am somebody who loves to learn by. Um, and then I asked them to, in, it's only a hundred words or less, but what, what this is, is getting them uh, warmed up to the idea of chat GPT and gen AI, but also in responding to it. So I asked them to paste what chat GPT came up with and then respond to it. And what were some of the gaps you saw? Was this useful? Was it accurate? Did it, um, was it in alignment with the readings we did this week? Uh, what, you know, what could be some of the problems with using it this way? So for me, I did this fairly early in the semester in order to just get them thinking about, um, play. and a lot of students actually said, well, this was quite inaccurate or it, it didn't write, you know, it was cheesy or, there were several really important responses that I think um, students came up with, and, and they're being quite discerning in terms of their reactions to it. And then the next thing I did was later in the semester, and Padlet has this option, actually Lucas Wright taught me about this, but it has an option for um, you know creating visuals on the Padlet board. And uh, after doing a reading, I asked them to take certain concepts and um, talk about their ideal adult learning environment and what are some of the key characteristics of it. And then they 
you know, chose, they, they posted a visual of that learning environment. And I got them to connect it to the readings we had done. So you can see in some of the resp uh, responses below it, they are connecting their reaction or, or the, the visual to the readings. And this was, these were fairly popular activities. Students enjoyed them. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that it answers any big ethical questions, but it's it's just one way I've been trying to weave it in. Thank you. Yeah. So those are a couple of um, helpful, concrete experiences um, with the sort of integration of, of AI. And as, as both of you have sort of mentioned, this is still in a very experimental uh, phase. Um, so... Um, yeah, I, I think at this point, just given that I want to make sure we have time for audience questions, um, we're gonna I'm gonna start by turning things over to those audience questions. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, please use the Q and A um, uh, function, I guess, in Zoom. We've got a couple of these up here already, although I think a number of them have sort of been addressed by um, by some of your answers already. Um, so I'll do, I'll, I'll ask this one from, uh, from Bree Weir, thank you. Um, so I'll just read it off. So something that occurs to me is that we are using AI as a jumping off point for considering more and more how the methods we use to evaluate are proxies. Um, so that redesigning a assignments to be AI proof is maybe not so helpful, but taking this opportunity to reconsider what our assignments or evaluations proxies are actually measuring could be uh, just really supportive for our effective teaching practices overall. Um, is this something that any of panelists are directly considering in their own work? Uh, and so please correct me if I'm I'm uh, I'm wrong here, um, but I think my understanding here is AI is basically giving us um, in, ass in assessments or assignments, the opportunity to once again, really closely look at what our assessments actually are measuring. Um, uh, and so please do correct me if I've misunderstood that question in, uh, in the Q&A tab. Um, yeah, uh, how does that strike any of you as a panelist? Is this a question you've engaged with already? Is it something you're looking to engage with? I'll turn it out to you. Um, I will briefly say this, that uh, yes, I mean, um, I see AI as a capacity expansion uh, tool of instructors and also of learners, that means maybe uh, whatever learning outcomes I'm, you know, the course has carried so far, should they be revised, right? So, uh, and, and by extension, should program learning outcomes be reconsidered and maybe revised? So, because now we are talking about if it is a capacity expansion tool, and as previously here, it was mentioned that in the professional work environment, the productivity expectations may also be revised because of uh, you know widespread presence of these tools. If that is the case, then yes, maybe learning outcomes should be slightly different. And if that is the case, then I'm not, not just talking about just trying to modify the same assignment with the same outcomes attached to it, but thinking about something totally different, right? then now it is going to assess something else and not the writing skills, not the diction, you know, those kind of things. So that is something I'm thinking about. And when I, I yeah, so so that that uh, is directing my incorporation of the way I incorporate AI uh, in uh, assessments. Um, I'd love to add to that. Um, I'd also want to say that it could also be like um, the learning outcome is the same, but the way of getting there is different. So like kind of referencing what Kari just shared with us and also um, Dr. Yusuf's uh, secondary component I mentioned earlier, adding to his um, assignment. So like kind of um, tailoring the rubric to uh, ensure that like what the students are doing with the AI um, is something that the AI cannot do, like for like for now, is generating citations, for example. Um, we know from examples that even the students brought up yesterday that some citations that are being generated are completely made up. So um, 
kind of like once they once students find their citations, uh, the secondary component of turning that into a visual abstract um, would show that they have that understanding that from the what they read in the literature review or whatever that they're um, doing. So yeah, it's kind of like just kind of rethinking like how students are getting there. Yeah, uh, I also want to and just add to this. I think that's very important to maybe have some specific skills that we can actually, as instructors, start to think about, like put the, put this into each course. For example, one thing it, I I will ask my student to do is to develop a routine to check the generated answers, right? So you, so how do you do that? How do you define this task first? Right? You may actually get some help from ChatGPT to begin with, right? Then you start with a plan, and then you execute this plan for every assignment you do. Then throughout the course, you learn the skill, then you can use it for, for the future job. So you know, like when you, when you are looking at, for example, generate tax, those are the three things I need to do. Uh, I think that's something we can uh, apply to all disciplines, I think. Yeah, something like this, like a small piece, but uh, really kind of um, can be inserted to each curriculum will be helpful. Right? Fantastic, thank you. Oh, Vika, sorry. I, I just want to kind of remind us and something I really think we should highlight is we are basically catch trying to catch up. The, the speed at which the change is occurring is, is frankly like shocking to me. Every time I'm attending a new seminar led by Lucas, I'm learning completely new things. And, and I remember in October, I was in a panel and a faculty member from history shared their experience uh, of doing an assignment, uh, having an assignment in the course in which students were asked to basically write a, a, a history-based question or essay using ChatGPT, and then do that again in, so they did that in March last year, three months into ChatGPT, and then in September, and uh, all the you know insights from March outcome was a lot of inaccuracies, hallucination, et cetera, all of that largely went away by September, right? So. This rapid change uh, is is that that means like whatever insights we're discussing today may not be really valid, right? And the same thing will apply to students also, right? If they make up their mind about how they're feeling uh, in one term, second term, their peers may be feeling completely different, and they may have to again try catch. So that is something I think I just wanted to highlight here. I just want to say that that. Bree's question is fantastic. I think it is the essential question, at least for me in my teaching practice. Um, I, th you know, I think the, I, I, my experience with undergraduate students, and again, it's nice that this panel has a diversity of different types of learners, but my experience with undergraduate students is that I'm consistently surprised at how concerned they are about small grade differences. And it's worth thinking about the incentives they face when they have five courses plus work, uh, caring for family members. There's, we all know that the, the a time is probably the greatest challenge. And one possible solution to me would be to change how we grade, um, to incentivize learning as opposed to trying to get the best possible grade, whether that's just four letter grades or even pass fail. Like, I, I don't know that that would actually solve the problem at all, but it's it's not surprising to me that some adult learners and some graduate students are, you know, have, have a certain priorities uh, or approach learning differently and that they are much more likely to engage uh, in these clever assignment designs that we've seen some examples of, whereas some undergraduates who are facing more limited time constraints and are focused more on grades, that they will seek the fastest route. Um, again, like I just think that if 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 it didn't matter, the three percent difference didn't matter, or the five percent difference didn't matter, that might change their incentive structure. But I'm not actually sure. Yeah, thank you. There's really again this sort of invitation to to address the questions that we're that are coming up here sort of in collaboration with our students um uh and 
really in, in dialogue and in conversation with their actual lived needs um, and their lived understandings um, and not necessarily what we hope those are. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. It's already been addressed uh, by Kari in the, in the chat, but I'd like maybe to, to expand it a little bit more uh, and get more voices involved here. Um, the question is, how can we combat the marginalization of certain points of view, for example, indigenous or queer perspectives when using LLMs in the classroom? So in, in, in a way, this can tie back to uh, some of the comments made in the keynote by Dr. Brian uh, Dewsbury, right? Uh, where these LLMs tend to... Um, spit back at us some of the um, biases and narratives and stuff that, that prevail in the larger conversations in our culture. Um, and then if, you know, students are kind of drawing on those to answer questions, it's only going to magnify that. Um, so, um, you know, these things are here and they've got the, the, the um, data sets that they've got. Um, what do we do um, to maybe at least interrupt that spiraling uh, magnification of uh, some of these destructive narratives? I'll probably say just two things. One, uh, in students' reflection about doing these exercises based on Gen AI tools, uh, I did find their uh, ready acknowledgement of bias, right? Uh, whether or not it came up in their exercise, but they were very aware of these challenges. Um, uh, and and so that was revealing to me that they are they're understanding these, these, and in fact, that came up uh, yesterday also in student panel. Uh, the other thing, one line that I've described, uh, one phrase that I used to describe um, Gen AI tools is I I do use them as an assistant, right? As, as if I've hired an assistant paying whatever amount per month, but it's a very sycophantic assistant, right? It would always try to please you. And so it of course will uh that the biases existing in the information space as it is, it is accessing that are always present, and that's what is uh, helping it. Um, produce answers, but it will also magnify in order to please you, your own biases, right? So I think uh, in future, I think if I'm talking about AI in class, I'm going to include that description and characterization of the tool um, that th this this is not this is not going to go away. I mean, th th because this uh, uh, that is how it is trained to give you answer. Right, and if you're unsatisfied, to continue to give you answers until you're satisfied, right? And that that description, I think, could be helpful partially. Um, yeah, I, I, I also kind of want to add a little bit. I feel like uh, we can we can look at this from a different angle. Is that that's something cannot that Jenny cannot do itself, right? So that's our opportunity, basically, right? If you look at what cannot be replaced. That's a place. Uh, that's the thing we uh, that cannot be replaced by ChatGPT. So that then falls on to the instructors to do due diligence and uh, remind, as Vesca mentioned, remind the students that there are, you know, bias in the training data, right? And also, uh, what I tend to do is I bring them in the latest news. For example, all these big IT companies, you know, the the, the developer of foundational models, what they are doing to help reduce bias. They're, they're doing their due diligence as well. And then I think it's also important for the student to be aware of the progress so, um, so that they're more comfortable of using those tools. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention like in the language disciplines, for example, um, dialect and pronunciation is very important. We're all teaching about the the diversity of ways in which one might speak Spanish, but some of the more, to use Jane's terminology, like the automations, like the responses that are automated are are cued to a more sort of, um, I guess what word would call a traditional Spanish. And so answers that students are providing that are actually correct um, are being discarded because they don't jive with the automated responses. And then 
Um, if anyone's used Duolingo for learning another language, you might have seen that if you're pronouncing something, Duolingo will not respect anything that isn't very precise and recognizable by the machine. So um, I, I agree that, you know, this is our opportunity to express interlinguistic and intercultural awareness or, um, you know, just keeping an open mind to some of the advances that are that are coming about um, in our disciplines so that students are aware that, yes, things are in the works, but these are imperfect things. And, and in my case, the main goal is communication. So as long as communication is taking place, we will privilege um, those as successful engagements, right? So that's a really great question. I, oh, I was, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was also, I, I had responded in the chat, but I also wanna say that um, one of the things I could imagine doing is that there's a lot of incredible scholarship out there from diverse authors, and maybe they're not the ones that ChatGPT would draw upon, but in your prompt, in the way that you engineer your prompt, you can actually ask them, you can ask it to center a certain, so I could say, um, please center your argument around Linda Tui Smith's paper on blah, blah, blah. So um, I think that's one way we could consider, uh, again, if you train your, if you train your own Gen AI, then that's a way that we can train it is by prompting it to always be integrating diverse authors. But again, I don't know how long it takes to to take that on um, in the in the longer term. Yeah, and that this is a really good idea, Harry. Um, I wanted to just add to kind of um, clarifying for students that like when you are working with an LLM, it's trained on a data set and it's only as um, free of biases as that data set. So, um, in kind of like looking for citations that are like, I don't know if folks have heard of the term citation justice, but kind of like it's basically, um, as they said, um, as folks said already, diversifying your citations. So um, kind of talking about historical and social biases in your class and how that translates into LLMs and how we can avoid that is really good conversation. And Vegas, go ahead. Uh, one, one thing maybe uh, we have tried to attempt, you know, uh, answer this question, the broader question of where it is heading, the information landscape, because the, we're talking about a feedback loop where what percentage of the new information that is generated and fed into the in internet is generated by AI itself. And that feedback loop, and, and whether it's 5% or 10% today, whether it will be 50% 10 years later, right? So that is a broader question at a societal level, at a philosophical level that I think not just one educational institution is going to reckon with, but this, this is a question that I have no idea how will be addressed or discussed and at what level, uh, whether uh, some future regulatory intervention may have any impact on it. I have no idea, but that is a broader question um, which will have impact beyond education, but certainly on education also. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of, of really sort of emphasis on communicating with students about um, how these biases are are built into um, the data set. But uh, I also want to highlight um, what, uh, again, what Vikas had mentioned uh, in the initial response that um, it's also <clears throat> a tool that can enhance our own biases. Right, like it, it, it is a, a sycophant. I, I, I like that uh, that way of thinking about it. Um, uh, but you know, of course, um, problematic information <laughs> reaching our students and being believed for them is not really a new problem, right? Um, uh, you know, it may be um, enhanced <laughs> by AI as it enhances so many other things, uh, but we have been worried about this maybe um, for a while. Um, and we have been trying to, to educate our students to be discerning um, and sort of telling and warning them about um, the way they consume information and what they believe. Um, but I'm wondering, and this is maybe asking you to imagine things on your feet. Uh, so um, 
But given the, the theme that we've been hearing here about involving and collaborating with students um, in solving some of these problems um, or addressing some of these problems with AI, are there ways that you can imagine or maybe you know, the cult that come to mind that you've seen of involving students in the problem or in addressing the problem of um, feedback loops and bias and things like that, both, again, their own and the, the ones built into the data set uh, that you might be able to share with, uh, with the group or with the audience here. Can you ask the question again, Joseph? Sure. Uh, so basically, a lot of the responses have been really helpful in thinking about how do we inform students? How do we tell them, basically, about how do we warn them about um, bias uh, in the use of LLMs um, in generating responses and in learning, really? Uh, but my question is, uh, so in a way, that's, that's us warning them. We're telling them about it. Um, are there ways that you can imagine, um, given the themes that we've heard here, collaborating with students in coming to their own understanding and their own answers about how they are going to monitor um, their own use of the LLMs for bias? And maybe, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, well, I think Kari's example that she shared, um, screen shared earlier, is is one of a great way to do it by comparing um, something that was an output from the the LLM tool and then um, the student's own interpretation or understanding. So just putting that side by side, where where are the, what biases do they see in the one that was output from um, the tool? And yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that as well, like some kind of a adaptation of the thing I had shared, where instead of the question being, what are what might some of the inaccuracies be with this, we could ask them to identify what are some of the biases of what ChatGPT considers expertise or knowledge? Where to, you know, if if you just gave it carte blanche and said, give me the five key concepts uh or core ideas to this theory or this idea, um, who did it draw from and why why did it draw from those particular people and let's have a conversation about that uh i think i think those are some ways we could we could do it and you could you know just as i'm doing it in an online forum you could have students to um take you could take an example of a printout of an output and you could put them at tables in a real classroom and have a group conversation about it as well i think one i think uh uh one thing I'm, I'm cautioning myself um, for is, uh, carry something you mentioned, look for inaccuracies or accuracies or verify it or, or compare it or uh, analyze it. That I think are meaningful ways of uh, phrasing it if we are using the word bias in describing the process uh, there's likelihood that you know when when if students are looking for biases, they will look find biases, right? So but but the analysis should reveal biases, right? Comparing, uh, finding inaccuracies, uh, identifying inaccuracies should reveal biases. So that is a thread, depending on which course context. I think we'll have to be careful um, uh, following. Yeah, so I'm hearing in these responses, um, involving the students in this process, um, by just sort of turning turning the task over to them and, and, and highlighting it and saying, okay, well, there's bias here. On the one hand, can sort of train the the skill to to find those biases, but then there's also this caution um, that uh, there's a difference between doing that when you're being primed to do so and just doing it like all the time. Um, and there's probably a continuity between those, right? So you have to kind of make it a conscious effort first and then internalize it. Um, yeah, um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna turn, I think we've got, yeah, we should be able to, to get to this one as well. I'm gonna, I'm going to um, turn to another question from the audience here. Um, so the question is, do you think that a competency-based approach would be, would help in integrating Gen AI into your teaching and evaluation? Um, and 
This is from Yannick uh, Leroux. Um, if you if you could uh, maybe even um, say a little bit about what you mean by competency based approach, uh, you could either throw it in the chat or um, raise your hand, and uh, we'll allow you to speak. Um, yeah. So, Audrey, could you? Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, complete space approach essentially just focusing on cognitive skills rather than memorizing, um, and and just like focusing on teaching to that. So, um, to bring students to analyze, um, to really go a little further with the knowledge that they have. Um, so it's uh, kind of something that's used in K to twelve education. Um, which is uh, focusing on, on competencies right now. And um, I'm just wondering if focusing on the competency and and teaching to that and, and uh, assessing the development of competencies uh, would be a, sort of a way to um, use AI and, uh, and avoid um, kind of focusing on, on the content that it Thank you. Yeah. So basically, a shift from um, a content focused in in teaching to um, a competency or skill, or the, the opportunity to express a, a competence, competency or skill. If that's um, yeah. a fair paraphrase. Yes. Okay. I think yeah. I can speak to that because in language we do um, skill focused assessments all the time. We're always looking at their reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And I think um, one of the tendencies as new things come up, even if I'm thinking about um, when we shifted to online teaching at the beginning of the pandemic and thinking about what that would mean for language teaching and learning, um, there was a tendency to move toward more oral assessments. So putting a larger emphasis grade-wise, um, skill-wise on that skill, which was so hard to, to bring out in that online environment, I think. And it, it caused so much anxiety for students. Um, so I think, you know, we do have a well-rounded approach to skill-based um, assessment, but it's it's still really hard to um, to sort of think about how how we're going to get students to think about um, you know speaking as a process, listening as part of that puzzle, and then working into the skill of writing in this environment because we've had to dramatically rethink. I mean, even with Google Translate, right? It was something that you know, Canvas made it really easy because if somebody took text from Google Translate and copied it into an online exam, it highlighted in gray. And I don't know that that was like a known, but that was always a conversation starter. Like, why is your text, you know, highlighted in gray? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, going back to that question of involving students more, I think that was definitely an opportunity to think about that particular skill um, and, you know, what happens from an instructor's standpoint when, when how can we tell immediately if it hasn't been generated by the students? And a lot of it is level. So thinking about that skill in particular with um, artificial intelligence, students can actually now tell ChatGPT, for example, I want to produce a piece of writing with this vocabulary, this grammar at this specific level. So I do think, um, you know, that is a way to go, but it still requires a little bit of thought in terms of, of how to approach it from a process-oriented uh, approach, too, so that we're not just focusing on that final output. I think Vikas was next. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this is what I kind of meant when I uh, talked about reconsidering learning outcomes. So from, you know, relying on having students learn factual knowledge is, should be increasingly less relevant, right? Uh, we're talking about what other competencies that students can develop in the course. And uh, as if AI is, is helping with that capacity, we can lean more into competencies. The challenge is then AI, as Bian, you also mentioned, the, the competencies of AI is also rapidly changing, right? So 
synthesis, application, um, uh, integration of knowledge, all of that, even AI is able to do very well. So then maybe some other way of thinking about this could be, now, if I imagine student, uh, a learner to not just be someone who has to complete a task, but is always carrying a, a research assistant or academic assistant or a tutor with them, that means that whatever I assign to them, any exercise becomes a project and they are the project manager, they are the leader, and then the outcome could, if I imagine it like that, then the, the expected output could be more sophisticated, complex, um, in which they also have to think about how to now use their team uh, and uh, reach this output. Right? That could be one helpful way of, of doing it. But yes, I'm leaning more towards competencies. It should be the first step, I think. Oh, and I think a, a good thing to add to what uh, Vika just said is um, if like a competency-based approach, um, oh, sorry. Competency-based approach kind of like implies that you're defining um, the competency at the start of the class, but just kind of like ensuring that you're speaking with your students and saying, because uh, um, these AI tools may have updates or changes, there's going to be some flexibility to that competency. I think it's a important thing to note note because if it changes without that kind of prefacing, it could be something that makes the students feel like it's like a little like unstable or something like that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <clears throat> we only have a few minutes left, so, but I, and so I sort of want to give us an opportunity to to um, wrap up and, and sort of close on a, on a consolidating note. Um, and so maybe take a moment to think about this. Um, so given the conversation that we've had here, um, and I guess I'll give you the option, um, I, could you share maybe one question that has been raised for you that you think that you're going to you like to continue to think about um, as a result of the conversation that we've had here today, or um, one kind of big takeaway that um, you want to, to draw from this and you want to maybe highlight for uh, those in the audience um, as something that, that felt very important to you. Well, to me, I actually really like that question, but I couldn't answer because I don't have the knowledge is that, you know, how can we actually develop the AI literacy and ethics? As we talk about, we, we kind of talked about, you know, CTLT help to, <laughs> to build a course, and then we try to put out, uh, compile all the best practices. But I think I, I think there's still a long way to go. And that's something I would lo love to actually look into and uh, probably gradually uh, incorporate into my teaching as well. So, yeah. I think for me, the, the idea of working with students to arrive at a uh, better understanding of of how what their concerns and anxieties are and and where we're coming from but also how to move forward and um you know sort of thinking about the fact that you know yeah as andrew said they're taking multiple classes but they're always they're also working toward a discipline and a, a career pathway most likely in some cases right and so thinking about how we can move forward using their disciplinary knowledge also in their goals as learners and, and future employees um, to really make the best of this while they're here at UBC. Uh, this one is probably unachievable, but uh, talking about this really made me feel how constrained we are by FIPA rules, uh, copyright rules, uh, intellectual property, property rules, et cetera. And the fact that students could be using a diversity of AI tools, which we can't even, it's like, we can't acknowledge exist, or we can't, we can't require them to use, uh, even something like Google. Um, and, you know, I don't think we're going to change the <laughs> legislation, but, uh, it would be nice if, if we had a little more room to maneuver and that's well outside the scope of, any individual instructor. I actually have a question in response to that, Andrew, and that is, 
Is it just, it, we can't require them to use it, but we could give them an option. So for example, an assignment where they have an option to do this or an option to do that, like that would be all right, as long as it's not a requirement. Is that correct? I think that's right. Yeah. That makes okay. Sense. Yeah, yeah. But also, I think uh, I, I, I attend one of the workshop, basically, people saying that we need to be cautious about because you may actually inadvertently give advantage to the people who pay $20 a month, then they get higher marks. So how can you differentiate that? Right. So, um, I mean, like the, the, the pro version of chat GPT, right? So you, it can generate, for example, you can upload a document and analyze the document, generate a report for you. But if you, you use the free version, you don't have that capacity. So, mm -hmm. so that that's something. Yeah. Uh, another layer. Go ahead. Uh, one way I've tried to mitigate that is I'm I'm in any chat GPT assignment I'm not evaluating the output from the AI tool at all. Right, that is not part of the assessment. The assessment is about the completeness of tasks and their reflection on it, and and if there is a verification task or trying to compare the output with something else, that is right. So and. Uh, now, I think I've learned even you don't need to create an account for uh, using the free version of ChatGPT. So that is where we are moving. So, and I did ask them, which version were you using? But it was not to, it was for my own kind of curiosity. Uh, and most of them were using the free version, but some were actually using the paid version. My closing reflection is just that um, this has been super helpful for me. I feel like I've gotten some great ideas and also this piece of involving, yeah, involving students in the conversation. I think our students know by and large more about this stuff than we do and having their expertise present in the discussion is actually really important. Yeah, it's uh, mine is basically along the same lines, but also I just want to reiterate uh, something that a participant also posted and was mentioned yesterday, the privacy impact assessments. So the the one that was posted today is like on um, uh, for generative AI instructional use. So just ma making that more robust and expanding on it over time, I think is a good takeaway I have from all of this. All right, we're at, our, at the end of our time together. I want to thank all of you so much for this really robust and thoughtful conversation and for, for bringing your experiences, your voice, and your perspective um, on behalf of the audience, which I'm sure took a lot out of this. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to, to thank you very much. And um, I think we'll sort of wrap things up here. Uh, keep in mind there are still events going on, uh, additional panels uh, related to Celebrate Learning Week. Uh, so please do check those out. Um, and thank you all again so much. This was really an enjoyable conversation.